Good morning guys from an overcast Istanbul. Today I'll be flying from here to Atlanta, Georgia with Turkish Airlines on one of their Dreamliners in business class. My flight this afternoon departs towards the north out of Turkey's largest city. We'll cross over much of Eastern Europe and then Scandinavia. Traversing the Northern Atlantic, we'll pass over Iceland and Greenland and then down the height of Eastern Canada. Continuing south into Freedom Land, we'll arrive in Atlanta, Georgia, which has the as of yet largest airport by passenger volume in the world. In total, it'll take over 13 hours to fly the 5,760 miles. Istanbul is a beautiful place in perhaps an unorthodox way. It's not heavily gentrified, and the old city is as it has been for hundreds of years, and that's where the beauty lies. You need to know its history to appreciate its splendor, and you need to know its past to appreciate its present. This city has seen empires come and go, its Hellenistic roots preserved by its consequent Roman and Ottoman conquerors. Her people are a living legacy to the vast amounts of history that circles this small yet infinitely consequential stretch of land. With sentiment aside, this place is a must visit, not only for history buffs like myself, but everyone who loves to travel. She's been the foci for the known world for over a millennium and continues to be the conflux of East and West. So today I'm showing you Turkish Airlines with whom you can stop over in this magnificent city and tour her attractions all for no extra cost. If you're flying in business, they'll even put you up in a 5 star hotel for 2 nights for free. I absolutely love the amount of history you can find here, Istanbul is one of my favorite cities in the whole world. With that said, for the past 1500 years, her traffic has really not improved, and getting anywhere by road in the core of the city can be a struggle during rush hours, especially on the lead up to the bridges and tunnel crossing the Bosphorus. Thankfully, the metropolitan area has a comprehensive tram and metro system that connects the two continents on which the city sits. The city is currently served by two major airports, Istanbul International Airport all the way in the north on the coast of the Black Sea, and Sabiha Yorkchen International on the Asia side near the coast of the Sea of Marmara. As of the posting of this video, the new metro lines to the new airport is still being built, so you can't really get there by public transport unless we're talking about a bus. Instead, taxis are probably your best bet, they are cheap, and once out of town, convenient as the newly built airport highways are never really congested. I've never personally had any issues with the taxi drivers here, but there have been some reports of tourists being scammed or ripped off, so just be alert and don't be stupid like anywhere else in the world. And as Istanbul has two airports, be sure to specify which one you're going to. Just refer to the new airport as the new airport or big airport and the driver will usually understand. If he or she doesn't, well then I wish you good luck. Now before we go, I would like to explain that yes, I do have three pieces of luggage, all of which I intend to check in on this flight. Hashtag team check in, hashtag hands free, hashtag go ahead and press that unsubscribe button. And the reason I can check in all three pieces for free is because I have Star Alliance Gold status, which among many other privileges allows me to, on Star Alliance flights, check in three pieces of luggage, each weighing 32 kilograms, regardless of the class of travel, which is frankly kind of ridiculous, but I'm taking advantage of it in this case. Now you're probably curious as to what is in those three pieces of luggage. Oh my, look at the time, uh, yeah, we gotta go. Istanbul's brand new international airport, aptly named Istanbul International Airport, is a behemoth of a building. There's a small domestic section, but otherwise the rest is made up of international gates. There's a huge check-in area and then an equally massive central concourse with tons of shopping, lounges, and other amenities. From here, there are branching piers, home to dozens of gates, but be prepared to walk because you're going to be doing quite a bit of it to get to your departure. Travelers in Turkish Airlines business class and select status holders can use a super well thought out and convenient stream from check-in to border control. This starts from the curbside where business class passengers and status holders have a special entrance. I don't care what anyone else thinks, the new copper and black palette that Turkish uses for its business class products and branding is so aesthetic. Right after the entrance is the first of many security screens I'll be going through today. Turkey's had some not so fun things happen in the last couple of years, so understandably there is heightened security. And in the airport this translates to a security checkpoint for anyone wishing to enter the check-in hall. This one is dedicated to passengers in business or those who have status. It can be a chore, especially for me in this case, as you do have to pass all your check-in luggage through the x-ray machine. Once through, you'll find yourself next to the priority check-in area, and once again I can't help but admire the sleek and sexy signage and decor. On the right side is the business class check-in hall, and on the left side is another dedicated check-in area for status holders, Starlines Gold, Turkish Elite, Elite Plus, and Corporate Club members. 
If you both have status and are traveling in business class, then you can choose whichever check-in area you want. Inside, they're pretty much identical, just a mirror copy of one another. In all the times that I've passed through here, I've never had to wait more than a minute to get checked in. If they see a line, they'll open up more counters. If you're traveling to the US, UK, or Canada, you'll have to first clear a passport and visa check before they let you check in. This got a little confusing because the sign isn't worded very well, and the staff were apologetic of that. After the very easy and expedient check-in, you'll find yourself once again just outside the dedicated border control area for business passengers and status holders. Turkey is one of those countries where you have to pass e-migration, e-migration with an E, but this was once again no issue since there were no lines and the officer was super friendly. She bid me farewell and said that she hoped I had a good time in Turkey. Immediately after this is the main security point, which is once again reserved for business class passengers and you get the point. The staff were super nice and even offered me a water bottle afterwards since you can't bring your own water through the security. That's actually super thoughtful and I wish more airlines and airports did that. Anyways, the whole thing didn't take me more than 10 minutes, and as strict as the security was, the process was streamlined, at least in my case. Can't speak for the economy check-in, never been through that here. Post pat down, you'll rejoin the people who came out of the numerous casual flyer security screens to find yourself in this beautiful atrium. Here, you'll have two choices in terms of lounges. Towards the right is the business class lounge, and towards the left is the miles and smiles lounge. They work much in the same way as check-in, meaning once inside, they're pretty much identical. In an effort not to make these videos hour-long feature films, and because I'm going to be referencing these lounges on other trips, I've uploaded a separate video going over them in detail. I even managed to get kicked out of one of them for filming despite having asked for and received permission. Disregarding that, these lounges are famous for the amount of amenities they have, and I do urge you to pause this video to check out that one. But for those of you who can't be bothered, here's a lightning round. <clears throat> Food, 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 business center, meeting rooms, kids play area, kids arts and crafts area, PlayStation 4 room, scale X, tricks track, golf simulator, movie theater, library, whatever the fuck this is, modern art gallery, nap room, shower suites, hotel style bedrooms, tea stations, coffee stations, alcohol stations, food, 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 and food. And that's not even all of it. This place is absolutely amazing in every sense of the word. Link to the full thing is in the corner and the description below. Anyways, back to the trip. After having been kicked out of one lounge and brooding in the other one for three hours, it was time to board my flight. All right, let's, uh, let's get out of here. Nice. I left a little earlier than usual as it does take a while to walk to most gates, as was the case for me. The airport has travelators absolutely everywhere, so I guess you can also stand and get to your destination, but I've been eating too much lately and could definitely use the extra exercise. At my gate, I was greeted with yet another round of security, but there was a dedicated priority line which I got to take advantage of. I had the same backpack as the guy screening me, so he let me through without a fuss. Once you're in, you're in. If you want to leave, you have to redo the entire pad down process, which can take 20 minutes given the line. There are no bathrooms in these closed off gates, so get your business done beforehand. As boarding time approached, it did get a little crowded in here, and with social distancing no longer an option, I brought my mask out. In the healthcare field, there are a few differing schools of thought when it comes to using surgical and N95 masks in public. I'm in no part qualified to preach, but I think it's situational, and a good idea to carry one with you, but please don't go out buying as many as you can, washing your hands and not touching your face is still the most impactful way to prevent contraction. Anyways, here's the plan that will be taking me to Atlanta, and hopefully not any coronaviruses with me, a 787-9, which at this point is still a relatively new addition to the Turkish fleet, having only been in service for over a year. I'm not gonna lie, I was very excited to see the Doe & Co catering van. Boarding commenced shortly and was done by class and then by rows, so there's only about three boarding zones if you count business class as its own zone. Turkish Airlines doesn't offer premium economy or first class on any of their flights, so it's only business and economy. We boarded through one bridge to the L2 door, and I quickly found my seat, 8A, or 8 Alpha. I don't, I'd like, stop telling me to use the phonetic alphabet. I know it, I'm not going to use it because you guys can hear me clearly. <clears throat> Anyways, these seats are made by Stelius, and if they look familiar, that's because they are also the same seats found on Singapore Airlines Medium Hall, Dreamliners, and A350s. Although, I'd argue the color palette on Turkish is much more modern and pleasing. There's one business class cabin which comes in a 1 to 1 format for a total of 30 seats. If you're questioning my math, the middle aisle stops at row 7, whereas the windows end at row 8. 
Odd number seats in the middle aisle are directly next to each other and offer a bit more privacy than the even number ones. The opposite is true for the window seats where the even number seats are more private, situated next to the window instead of the aisle. Let's now do an exhaustively detailed seat tour. Starting off with the beautiful 17-inch touchscreen IFE display, which also tilts out like this to give you better viewing angles when reclined. Legroom was not overly generous, but entirely adequate. I'm 181 centimeters tall and have completely ran out of Imperial jokes at this point, and I had a metric ton of legroom. The compartment does go quite deep, but is not all that wide, and the leading edge of the leg rest also flaps around like this. There's room down here for stowage, handy for keeping your shoes, which I ended up doing. The tray table deploys out from the underneath of the IFE screen and can be folded open like this. While it doesn't rest on anything, it's still quite sturdy. It's also very generous with how far it slides out to accommodate people of varying girth. Less generous is the fact that you're stuck in here though should your seat not be next to the aisle. Putting this away, I quickly learned that instead of trying to find the latch, all you have to do is give it a almighty shove. Almighty shove, come on, there we go, and it slows away. Alright, moving on. Over on this side, you have a literature pocket down here where you will find all the literature. If that's something that excites you, then the coat hook surely will as well. The crew will also happily closet your outerwear for you should you wish. Okay, moving on to the side console and storage cubby. This thing opens when you engage both latches, kinda overkill, but whatever. There's less storage space inside than it would otherwise appear, but there is a universal power outlet and USB Type-A charge point, so I guess it at least keeps your wires tidy and out of the way. Headphone hook, and a decent amount of table space. On the side of the cubby hole, there is also a mirror that slides out. Down here, there is a touch panel for your seat and lighting controls. There's also a dedicated button to turn the TV on and off. There's a three-prong headphone interface. And down here, the ever-popular Panasonic iFi controller. We'll have a closer look at this with the iFi system later. This leather upholstered armrest slides down to give you more shoulder room when sleeping, as does this one on the other side. Up here on the inside of the pod enclosure are three reading lights, and you can adjust their respective intensities. It doesn't show up very well on camera, you're just gonna have to take my word for it. These are also very fun to play with. Of course, you get a pair of massive Dreamliner windows, but the placement is a little unfortunate in my seat. The forward one is somewhat obscured by the seat in front of me, and the rear one is blocked by the pod's enclosure. But you can still get a clear view if you try. The seat and pod comes in the same goldish copper and black color palette, absolutely stunning. Evident too in the craftsmanship is the investment Turkish made into this product for its longevity. The materials and stitching is very solid on every fabric and seam, contributing to a high-end aesthetic and high-quality build. While some other airlines, <coughs> British Airways, uses felt for their pod enclosures to achieve comfort and noise dampening, Turkish Airlines uses Alcantara. Need I say more? Or at least it feels like it. It's definitely not cheap. Each seat also has a pair of its own air vents, and overall, it's just a beautiful cabin. At my seat waiting for me when I got here was a small pillow, light blanket, and a pair of slippers. No pajamas, but that's just me letting you know it's definitely not an expectation. After boarding, the flight crew came around with a tray of freshly made fruit cocktails and juices. I chose the lemonade, which is becoming a favorite of mine, though to be honest, I haven't ever tried any of the others. Anyways, here's some footage of me struggling to perform basic human tasks. Three zone boarding proved to work quite well, and before long the full flight was fully packed, and we began pushing back. As the jet bridge pulled away, it slowly revealed a highly sought after wing and engine view. If 
If you pay attention to these things, you'll know that Turkish Airlines holds a reputation for making some of the most fun but also over the top and ridiculous safety videos. Anyone still have this song stuck in their head? Song and dance that will get stuck in everyone's head for the rest of the flight! I got this! Yeah. Attention to all passengers on this flight, we're gonna have a good time in the air tonight. Imagine this video playing with a plane full of impressionable 12 year olds. I've lived through that. Thank God for noise cancelling headphones. It's a party in the sky with Turkish Airlines. Anyways, these days they're showing a much more toned down but still very cute animated film. This safety video played three times in three different languages on our taxi out to our departure runway, which took a good 30 minutes since it was the furthest one from our gate. So please also allow me to use this opportunity to highlight this very flamboyant seatbelt. seatbelt signs were turned off, the meal service began immediately, and with the imminent arrival of food, let's have a look at the menu, which comes in the shape of a minaret. These things are quite big, what I mean is both the size of the menu itself and the scope of the food available inside. Turkish Airlines partners with Doe Co on their joint venture named Turkish Doe Co. They cater airlines operating through and out of many Turkish cities and have a well-earned reputation for excellent food. All the food in the lounge I mentioned before are catered by these guys, and they even have their own chefs on board to oversee meal service and business class. So if I sound excited about the food that's about to come, that's because I very much am. Anyways, in addition to the food menu, there's also a beverage list with cocktails, and a separate wine list. Oh my god, I am going to get even fatter now. Service started with a drink from the bar. I didn't really fancy anything on the cocktail menu, so I ended up getting a glass of champagne. This was accompanied by warm mixed nuts. I was also given the first of many, many hot towels, which came out on the tray, which is a nice touch. Soon after, canapes arrived. This tarted aubergine thing had to be my favorite. Dining on Turkish is very much an occasion, and if anything is indicative of that, it's the mise en place. It seems these days that every airline is trying to spice things up a little bit with their salt and pepper shakers, but Turkish Airlines really knocks it out of the ballpark with these porcelain minarets, as they are an order of magnitude cooler than anything else out there. Another hallmark of this airline is their candle-lit dinner. Obviously these aren't real candles, but still, a very elegant touch. Appetizers come out on a tray, and from the cornucopia of food, you ask for what you want. I would have loved to show you the trolley, but the flight attendant didn't seem very comfortable with my camera, so I didn't bother her. I went for a salmon tartare, dolma, and prawns. This was accompanied with a pumpkin soup, all of which was unequivocally delicious. For the main course, I went with their signature dish, the grilled swordfish. I can't really tell what it's spiced with, all I know is that I was very sad when I finished it. 
Now the portions may look a little small, but that's because their dinner structure is more like a buffet than an a la carte style, so you can always ask for more of the same thing or try something else. I was tempted, but decided against it. Instead, I waited patiently for the dessert cart to roll around. When it did, I made a selection of baklava and pistachio ice cream. This was not the cheap stuff, it's the good shit that they drench with expensive honey, and these two pieces probably have the same energy content as a small hydrogen bomb. And on the subject of large reactive masses of hydrogen, by the time dinner service was over, the sun had begun to set. To us, the sky will stay in this perpetual state of twilight for quite a while as we chase the sun towards the east. Opinions of these dimmable Dreamliner windows can be quite polarizing, but in this instance it was nice to be able to watch the sunset without going blind. Service ended with another hot towel that came out on another square dish. They really seem to like their square dishes, they have a lot of those. Wanting to get a head start on my jet lag, I asked for a Turkish coffee. If you don't know, Turkish coffee is kind of like a hot coffee bean smoothie. If you're hypertensive, might not be a good idea to drink this. It's also a natural laxative, which brings us on to the next segment, the bathroom. Now this is a pretty bog standard Dreamliner bog. There are some plants in here which is a nice touch, as well as some creams and perfumes. But when you step in here, you do notice the scented diffuser, as it was quite pronounced. It smelled kind of like a Lebanese bachelor party. There's no window in here, but there is a full length mirror. The bathroom is also adequately spacious. And there's even a bidet, which makes sense given that it's a Middle Eastern airline. For some reason, even though it's not that special, I really like Turkish Airlines' cabin, something about the black seats and contrasting white interior. Anywho, there was supposedly supposed to be Wi-Fi on this flight, so I gave that a try. But I didn't get very far before I realized that there was actually no Wi-Fi. This is beginning to become a recurring theme for me. Oh well, it's not like I'm gonna do any work on this trip. Onboard roaming did work though, but the prices, as these things always are, was incredibly steep. So instead, I contented myself by watching the sunset. Alright, let's check out what they have to offer in the form of entertainment, starting off as always with the noise cancelling headphones. And if you're wondering why there's so much sunlight, well, the sun didn't actually set. Do pay attention to what I said about the perpetual twilight and the dimmable windows. Back to the headphones, they actually looked and felt very premium and had a decent amount of noise suppression. As far as airline noise cancelling headphones go, these were pretty good. But then again, they're not really Bose's QC35s, which are still kind of the gold standard. The IFE interface was a little bit cluttered, but still intuitive, and underneath the UI, there was tons and tons of content in many different languages. The movie selection was good, with a decent library of new releases. There were lots of contemporary pieces from all over the world, and I failed to see how anyone cannot find something they'd enjoy watching. There were also abundant TV shows, be it English or otherwise. You had a selection of popular North American and UK productions, although not that many episodes from each show. The choices from other parts of the world were also good, everything from old Syrian soap operas to Chinese celebrity cooking programs. I was happily surprised to find Top Gear among the selection, but was absolutely horrified when I realized the thumbnail had lied and this was in fact a new Top Gear. I immediately turn it off lest someone sees me commit this unforgivable act of heresy. But in all seriousness, there's almost too much content and functionality for me to cover. Everything from live TV to the ability to follow stock markets and view investment portfolios. The remote controller even works in portrait mode, which is something all airlines should do given how easy it is to use that way. You can use the interface to direct the crew to wake you up for a meal or at a certain time. You can even connect your own device wirelessly to cast your own content to the screen. The moving map is also quite versatile with the newest version of Voyager 3D. There's even a little pointer to the Kaaba and a countdown to the local prayer time for those who wish to be pious at 30,000 feet. There's also two outboard cameras whose feeds you can stream. Overall, this system is incredibly forward-thinking and impressive. Solid 10 out of 10.
The next five hours or so of my time was spent watching a couple of movies, looking out the window as we passed over certain countries, and periodically checking to see if there was any Wi-Fi service. There never was. During this time, the chef came around to pass out mid-flight snack menus for those who were still feeling peckish. I didn't get anything, but it did look good. As we crossed the northern Atlantic, the sun finally dipped below the horizon, and I came to the conclusion that I had stayed up long enough for the worst of my jet lag to be over, and with 6 hours left in the flight, I would catch some sleep. Before we do that, let's take a look at the amenity kit. The male version comes in a few colors, with mine being this burgundy. It's provided by Versace, but not the clothing brand, instead, it's the fragrance. The bag itself is made from leather, but otherwise there's nothing too special here. Inside, it's pretty well stocked. There's a fuzzy pair of socks, above average eye shade, dental kit, and the sample size perfume, or specifically eau de toilette, or toilet water in English. You also get a face mist, body lotion, and lip balm. In addition to that, you get a set of stickers to stick on your seat should you wish to indicate your intentions to the crew. There's also a handy pair of earplugs which comes in this handy case, which is very handy. And lastly, there's a small brochure in here. After the first meal service concluded, the cabin lights were dimmed and the crew came around for turn down service with mattress pads and duvets, offering to turn my seat into a bed. At the time, I politely declined, to which the purser told me to call her when I wanted to go to sleep. Not all airlines voluntarily offer a turndown service, so once again, this was a nice touch. The mattress cover and pillowcase were pretty easy to put on, so I did it myself. Although, the flight attendant wasn't very happy that I stole her job. Anyways, once reclined, the seat is quite comfortable. With both armrests lowered, there is a fair bit of wiggle room for your torso and upper body. Legroom was adequate, the width was a little conservative, but good height if you sleep on your side. The padding was also soft enough to comfortably do so. Once reclined, the seat's enclosure also provided a cocoon of privacy, especially with these window seats, you can definitely shut yourself out of the outside world. The seat controls are also in a convenient location, and there's no way to accidentally press on a button. Here is me pretending to be asleep, but after I put the camera down, I did get a few hours of solid shut-eye. When I woke up, we had just passed over Lake Ontario, about two hours away from our destination in Atlanta. The sleep was good, but not the best. It wasn't the widest bed, and I can understand why Singapore Airlines chooses not to use these seats for their longest flights. Anyways, when the crew noticed that I had woken up, they brought around yet another hot towel on yet another square tray, and offered me a juice. I think I got about 7 hot towels on this flight. At this point, it really wouldn't hurt just to install a couple of bathtubs. They also asked me what I wanted to eat for dinner. Lord give me strength, here we go again. The second meal came out on a tray, but still featured 3 courses. The appetizer was a beautiful smoked salmon and celeriac salad, which came on a single slice of tomato. There was another pair of these adorable minarets, a Turkish rice pudding, and a bowl of what Americans call leftovers. Did you really think that I was going to go a whole video without including an American joke? Oh come on now. I would highly recommend that you give Turkish or Arabic rice pudding a try if you ever get the chance. It's not what you think, it's super light yet very creamy. The main course came soon after, and I opted for the prawn and lobster tagliatelle. Everything about the food on this airline is so good, I really can't say that enough, and I don't have anything else to say anymore about it. Damn. Of course there were desserts, but at this point I was already filled up to the brim, so I contented myself with just some coffee. As the dinner service was wrapping up and I received yet another hot towel, we began our descent into Atlanta. I don't get to fly Turkish that often, at least not anymore, and I wish I did. I really don't know why Skytrax won't give these guys 5 stars, they're more deserving of that than some of the airlines that have 5 stars. <coughs> Lothansa. Their food and business class is often much better than the first class food of other airlines, and their service is just amazing. The attention to detail, the intricate service items, the energetic and super hardworking staff, it's just a fantastic airline that goes well above and beyond the industry standard. It's so immaculate, what I mean is the branding, the products, the presentation of everything, the tiny little details, and- oh. 
Well, I guess this is happening. So this is what you call a go around or in the industry, somebody fucked up. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and dear children, this is your captain speaking to you due to the preceding aircraft in front couldn't uh, evacuate strongly on time. We had to go around. Sorry for this inconvenience and thanks for your understanding. We'll be landing in 10 minutes. Thank you. He lied. We landed in 11 minutes and 28 seconds. Oh, uh, if you made it this far, go check out my Delta One experience on their A350 afterwards. It was a great experience. And when I say great, I meant terrible. Okay, a few things to touch on before I finish the video. The service wasn't perfect. Uh, there was one instance when a cabin crew member forgot a drink order I had, and another instance where I asked for a bottle of water and that didn't get delivered, uh, and, and then I didn't, get some, I didn't get offered bread on the last meal, but that's perfectly fine. With the amount of details and pieces and plating and just the things that happen with their service, it's totally excusable. Uh, the Wi-Fi didn't work, which was kind of a bummer, but whatever. It wasn't really a business-heavy trip, so I didn't really need that. Um, apart from that, it was a great experience. I hope that I managed to show you some of that through uh, this video. And until the next time, safe travels.